Hello and welcome back to The Deal Room and we've got quite the show for you today because we're going to talk about the IPO market. We've had Arm, Instacart, Clavio, and Birkenstock. Uh, the latter, I thought, probably hit its peak when I was at university back in the early noughties, but apparently not. They're looking to IPO uh, at this present point in time. So a couple things just to give you a bit of a preview of what Stephen and I are going to discuss in this episode. We've got, is the IPO market opening back up? That kind of was the lead of a number of mainstream finance publications of this week, following those ones I've just mentioned. But how is this different to that boom that we saw in the IPO market back in 2021? Importantly, hopefully, I'm going to be able to extract out Stephen, what is the difference between what was happening then and what is happening now? And a few um, precautionary tales about this kind of first day pop, because we have seen some pretty extreme price reactions on Arm and Instacart um, just in the last two weeks. And then stay tuned, because at the end, we've been talking to a lot of students and all of the applications are, are pretty much fully open now, particularly in the banking space. And one of those common questions that we get always is, how do you kind of talk about a current deal that is happening? And I see lots of people sharing information about there's this deal, there's that deal. But what I'm going to get Stephen to do, hopefully, or, or get out of him, is not only talk about the deals in a bit more detail, but talk about the role of what investment banks play. And then importantly, what does that actual, what are all the different players between uh, the lead underwriters, the advisors? Mm -hmm. And I know that there's many levels to that, because I think if you know that, I think you can really stand out in the interview process. I think your odds go up substantially. And so hopefully, if you stick around to the end, uh, Stephen will share his thoughts on how to tackle that that inevitable question. But Stephen, the hoodie is on. I, I assume winter is, is here. <laughs> Winter's very much here. I'm actually still kind of coming down from our from our summer party on Friday, where I got into I got into our office and it was full of Amplify polo shirts and t-shirts and hoodies. So I just grabbed whatever I could. <laughs> That's my you know. So my winter fashion is Birkenstocks and an Amplify hoodie. Oh, <laughs> I know right this isn't topic. a fashion podcast, but <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. Where do you want to start then? There's been so many, it seems. Um, I know you wrote on LinkedIn earlier this week. It's like waiting uh, for, for London buses. You wait forever and then they all come at once. So which one do you want to start with? Oh, gosh, it's a good question. Well, let's go Let's go sequentially from Arm, which, uh, which priced and launched last week, all the way through to Birkenstock, which is looking to launch in October. And we can kind of take them one by one because they all have slightly different flavors. And then we'll, maybe we'll try and tie them together with a bit of a 2021 retrospective. So I think it's always good. We're talking a lot about about IPOs on this podcast and you know, my background's M&A. So we, we dealt with the equity capital markets team quite a lot, but this is certainly something that is interesting to me, but it's it's not my background. So it's, it's, it's very fascinating for me to get deeper into these stories. But let's just take a look at Arm. We spent a whole podcast last week talking about uh, the IPO and it priced last week, last Thursday, the 14th of September at $51 a share. And we were, you know, we try not to give investment advice on this podcast, but we were starting to go, we were nudging one way or the other last week on the podcast saying, here are the arguments for, I think maybe I was trying to sell you the, sell you the IPO at certain <laughs> times. <laughs> Cornerstone investor on the pod. Here we go. <laughs> um, if you got in at 51 and got out at its peak, on Friday of last week, you would have bagged a $15 per share increase. So it popped from $51 a share to 66 midway through last Friday. And that's a pretty healthy pop, bearing in mind that the trunk, you know, that they've raised over $5 billion in this IPO. So obviously, the smaller the volume, <laughs> the more extreme the exaggerations of share prices are likely to be, depending on demand. But this is a big book. So going up sixteen dollars, uh, you know, going up twenty odd percent, you know, that's an extra billion dollars on top of, you know, on top of the the five billion uh, IPO. So it's it's an interest it's an interesting one because we said last week on the pod, let's not let's not judge the IPO underwriters who priced it at fifty one dollars. Let's not judge the success of the IPO until 
the market settles. And it's still, you know, it's it's been trading for six days, right? So it's not anywhere near its settled stable price. That usually happens once the first earnings report has come out three months into the um into the uh, into the launch of the IPO. But it's now down to $55 a share. So it's come off from its $66 high. So $51 priced up to $66, down to $55. So, you know, it's feeling like it's kind of probably appropriately priced. And remember, you know, the IPO was 12 times oversubscribed and we had this roster of anchor investors putting in that $735 million. So they did all that and they had 28 banks on the ticket. So they did absolutely, they threw the kitchen, the kind of IPO kitchen sink at this deal. And they managed to get it away and get it away very successfully, which has given confidence to all of these London buses waiting in the wings, thinking, all right, you know, I'm quite interested in IPOing. I'm getting all of my ducks in a row. Let's have a look at what Arm does and then and then pile in if it's successful. So I think the general consensus is Arm um, successful enough. I'd say a good IPO, all things considered. And by the way, it's a good IPO for the banks because they got paid $105 million for their for their troubles. <laughs> uh, so not not a bad little payday. But um there's still, yeah, obviously there's still a lot of question marks about the IPO markets, which may well get resolved by Instacart the next company we're going to talk about. Yeah, and I know that one's really dominated the last couple of days. I think we're, from when we're recording this, it was their first day trading uh, yesterday. So yeah, tell me a little bit about, about that story and how that's probably a, a unique story in itself. Yeah, so Instacart is the, uh, is the US e-commerce uh, kind of grocery platform. So it basically is a technology company that helps grocery uh, groceries get delivered to individuals, to uh, consumers, uh, and it's a, it's an interesting story, and it's <laughs> it's a really good representation of what we say quite a lot when we're teaching here at Amplify, which is, <laughs> you know, a company is either a good deal or a bad deal depending on the price. You know, <laughs> it, it's still the same company, but if it's at a good price, then it's a really good deal. If it's overpriced, then it's a terrible deal. So, and this is and this is kind of the history of Instacart. Now, Instacart was founded back in 2012, and it was one of uh, it, it got its break on the Y Combinator uh, venture accelerator. We might have spoken about this back, you know, a few months ago in the podcast. But that is the kind of the Ivy League finishing school, oh, or, or, or maybe even starting school for high potential startups just looking through the roster of illustrious alumni, you've got the likes of Stripe, Airbnb, DoorDash, Coinbase, Dropbox, Gusto, Flexport, GitLab, Reddit, Docker, all coming through this accelerator program where it's very, very hard to get on. And then they turbocharge your business with amazing advice, amazing access, um, a really robust six month accelerated startup environment. So Instacart went through that process, right? And, <laughs> and at that point, Vinod Kosler, Kosler of Kosler Ventures invested a million dollars of his own money at an extremely low valuation. Who knows what it was, but not very much, right? Right at the pre-seed, very nascent, very risky level. Thinking about valuation, whether it's a good deal or not. So fast forward 10 years, well, 2012 up to 2023, the company in 2021 during the venture hype cycle was valued <laughs> was valued as at $39 billion. So it went from nothing to $39 billion in nine years. Hype cycle, pretty crazy, mad valuation. <laughs> uh, the internal valuation that happened back in March of 2023, so their own internal kind of view of how much the company's worth, valued the company at about $13 billion. Now, this is all important because the IPO launched yesterday at the top end of its price range, which had already been upgraded to $30 a share, giving the company a market capitalization of $9.3 billion. So is this a good deal? 
<laughs> think about it from Kosler, who invested right invested a million dollars right at the beginning. Yeah, a million dollars at twenty million dollar valuation. It's now worth nine point three billion. That's a good deal. <laughs> the CEO who owned ten percent of the company on the IPO is now worth one point one billion dollars. That's a good deal. But for any kind of sucker in uh, venture capitalist that invested in 2021, $39 billion. This is terrible. This is a haircut. <laughs> this is a kind of 60, 70% haircut. Well, no, more than 60, 70% haircut. This is an absolutely horrible, horrible deal. So, you know, it all depends, you know, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? It depends at what point you, you drank the Kool-Aid um, and when you got in during the hype cycle. Yeah, it's, it's such, such a good lesson for life. <laughs> This idea of like looking around and looking at your peer group and looking at others and just understanding different perspectives. I think that story really sums that up. It's like what the founder exits with a $1 billion plus fortune. And then the VCs are like, oh my goodness, this is like the worst possible scenario. Um, so interesting. It's like I was working with some interns yesterday and they were doing trading in the live market. And they were they were trading and and they were making P and L's kind of profit losses of about uh, two thousand dollars, and I was like, they were like, that's my rent, and so from that person's perspective, that's like a month's accommodation. Whereas from a trader's point of view, and I think this is one of the things I don't know if you found this, Stephen, when you were working particularly on large M and A deals, you kind of become a little bit. Um, they, it becomes very abstract what you're doing and the numbers don't really mean the same as probably what it means to other people because you're just looking at it from a totally different lens. Yeah, um, <laughs> we're, we're terrible at thinking about large numbers, aren't we? We're re Especially when it comes to monetary terms, you know, what does it mean to have a billion dollars? What does it mean for Blackstone, who have just entered the S&P 500, to have a trillion dollars of assets under management? <laughs> it's in you know our brains are not kind of wired to deal with those that that you know that number of zeros on the end of a one uh so so yeah it's it's really good to try and contextualize and then try and see it from the perspectives of different incentives and uh and things like this but just to just to wrap up maybe on instacart i put this in the deal of the week back in monday uh, back on monday but just to try and draw some threads together remember arm had a bunch of cornerstone investors that would kind of uh well that would anchor the deal um and give confidence to institutional investors that are wanting to buy a piece of the ipo now instacart 660 million dollars raised 400 million dollars of which were tied up in cornerstone investors many of whom were venture investors in previous rounds so <laughs> So it's 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 an interesting one. It's kind of like, all right, these venture investors, many of whom have actually still made quite a lot of money because they would have invested in previous rounds when the valuation was a much, much lower. They're like, okay, we want our exit, but we want to make sure that our exit is stopped with us. That just right? sounds <laughs> that just sounds uh illegal <laughs> that activity, <laughs> surely. It, it's like yeah. I've got a pot of money. Let's just throw some more money at it so I can like exercise my option. It's just it's that seems very dubious, that type of activity. Yeah, I think it's 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 all about it's all about information, isn't it? And it's all about it's all about who 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 is the sucker if there is one. And so often, especially with direct listings, which we've spoken about previously in Coinbase. You know, the sucker is the cons the retail investor that gets given all of the kind of dopamine rush of an exciting company to buy into, whilst the uh, the the investors cash out and go off to Aspen and you know drink their champagne and, <laughs> and things like that. So so yeah, it, it you know look there was full, there was there was obviously full disclosure. You know, this was a big story within the within the industry, and you know, cornerstone investors are not you know, are, are pretty, pretty standard. But yeah, it, it, it reeks of doing everything that you possibly can to get a successful IPO away, much like the arm deal, you know, get as many cornerstone investors as possible, make sure that we're talking about it as much as we can in the news, get the best banks on it. And, you know, it was up as much as 40% yesterday. 
uh, and closed up 12% from its $30, um, $30 um, IPO price. Again, we'll wait for it to settle out. And remember, these, these investors have lock-in periods of you know, six months, 12 months, et cetera. Uh, so we'll wait till the dust has settled. But it's, yeah, it's another, it's another interesting IPO. And it's, uh, there's definitely some similarities coming through across the ones that we're looking at today. Okay. Two, two more on the docket then. So let's go with uh, Clavio, who, full disclosure, uh, I had to look at on YouTube to check if I'm, <laughs> if I'm saying their company name correctly. And uh, what was more funny, you said that on their company website, there's a video of employees all saying something slightly different, which for a marketing company <laughs> struck me as uh, pretty crazy. But uh, tell me about the the Clavio story. Yeah, well, I think it's Clavio, but anyway, <laughs> we're still we're still getting confused. Um, I'm going to call it Clavio. I'm going to go out on a limb. And again, this is not good. You know, call yourself Instacart. Simple. Call yourself Arm. Simple. Even call yourself Birkenstock. We all know how to pronounce it. Clavio, Clavio, it's it's a it's a tricky one. I, I read a there's a book I'm reading at the moment, and it talks about kind of social studies and uh, and and socioeconomic kind of classes and stuff like that. And it was saying about actually, if you're called James or David, or whether you're called something more peculiar, um, actually the, the data says on mass that if you have a more uh, recognizable name talking about obviously the country that we're residing in the UK, you're more likely to be given extra help. You're more likely to get a promotion. And it's only because part of the study says that regardless of talent, you're just the name that's recognizable and rememberable in someone's head. So yeah, I know this is, I'm clutching at straws here, but it's interesting. <laughs> like I can't even say a company's name is, uh, uh, well, yeah. look, it's going to stick with me. Um, but it doesn't give a lot of hope to the Stevens and the Antonies of this world. And they're not the most standout names. But anyway, <laughs> maybe I'll change my name. Um, yeah, so, Clavio. Um, so this is, yeah, this is the third in the kind of roster of the opening of the IPO market. And we don't need to talk too deeply. I just want to, again, try and tie some threads together. I think this is an interesting one. Remember, Arm, successful IPO. Instacart seems to be a successful IPO. Now, Clavio and Arm, very profitable company, very well-known kind of a piece of industry infrastructure as we discussed last week, Insta uh, Instacart, profitable company, um, you know, tech company, but it's got, you know, it's pretty embedded in certain markets. It's very good growth. Now, Clavio is a marketing automation platform, you know, pure play tech company. It is profitable. It made $15 million of net income on trailing 12 months revenue of 320 million, but it's pricing its IPO at $30 a share, which will give the, uh, give the company a market capitalization of $9 billion. So $9 billion of $320 million of revenue, you know, let's call it 29 times sales, right? This is, you know, which is nothing like what Instacart was going for, right? So I think that was about six or seven times. So this is now, I think this is probably going to push the tolerance level of investors a little bit more than Arm, which although it's very highly valued, is a well-known player and a big IPO. Instacart, which is, you know, from on a price sales perspective, which is what we look at a lot with these IPOs, it was a, is a lot more kind of rationally valued. So Clavio, this is going to be an interesting one. It's not very profitable, it's fast growing. It smells a little bit more like the 2021 IPOs in terms of the type of company, but then again, they're going for the cornerstone investment model. They've got BlackRock and Alliance Bernstein putting in $100 million, led by Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and City. So they're getting the big beasts out in terms of leading the deal. So they're, again, trying to ride on the back of these two other successful IPOs with a very similar playbook. And they're pricing at the top end of their range. In fact, they're going over the top end of their range because they're seeing very, very healthy subscriptions. But this does feel a little bit more like the 2021 IPOs um, <laughs> that we can that we can talk about as a as a bit of a cautionary tale. Hmm. And maybe before we get to some of those cautionary tales, because I know you've got some excellent examples of very recognizable companies, perhaps we could just have a, a quick look at Birkenstock. 
Okay, well, look, I'm, I want to give you, a, I want to ask you a question uh, about Birkenstock. How many pairs of Birkenstocks does the average US consumer of Birkenstocks own? How many pairs? Okay, so what, someone who, who owns a pair, but how many do they own? Exactly, exactly. Well, the fact that you're asking me, it's more than one. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go for three. 3.6 pairs. <laughs> I mean, 3.6 pairs. My God. So what, what would you get? You get different, you have your home pair, maybe you have your, your, your going out pair, but I guess you have different colors for different outfits. Yeah, but I guess I this mean, is, it's, moved, it's moved into the realm of fashion though, isn't it? It's gone from its original purpose, which was like a Jesus sandal back in the day to now being that your dad wore, your uncle uncle would turn up at the barbecue on the weekend and you'd be like, what? Put those toes away. So now <laughs> I, I saw the camo ones, bright pink. Like, I guess if it a, becomes a, a fast fashion moment, then I guess you have to have multiple, right? Yeah, and this is it. I mean, so I own two pairs, uh, full disclosure. I own the, the kind of the classic Jesus sandals and a pair of Birkenstock slippers, which I love. Um, not sure whether that's going to move the share price up or down, but anyway. <laughs> um, so, so they are very much on trend. You're absolutely right. And you see that, you know, I mean, they've done a brilliant job uh, inserting themselves into the right parts of society that's going to continue to increase the value of the brand and the hype around the brand. And it's a really interesting one because although they're experiencing a hype moment at the moment, um, you know, they were famously in the Barbie movie. Um, so I'm led to believe, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and list the, the, um, the consumer website saw its, uh, searches for Birkenstock jump 110% right after the Barbie movie was released. So it's kind of, it's doing a great job at, at hitting the zeitgeist at the right time, especially in preparation for this IPO. And what I'm going to be super interested to, uh, to find out a little bit more about on this IPO is, you know, is this a really enduring, you know, traces its history back to 1774, you know, it's owned by L Catterton, which is the LMVH investment vehicle, you know, trading and doing you know, most valuable company in Europe until very recently, doing an incredible job trading in luxury, trading in, um, you know, mature exclusivity, and you know, you, you get a pretty nice premium in the, in the markets for that. Is it going to go that way when it IPOs, which would be brilliant, and you'd probably see the you know the valuation go up from its eight billion uh, target, or is it going to go the way of two caution retails? And you mm. remember, I'm sure you remember both of these. Number one, Allbirds. You might remember Allbirds IPO again, very very hypey. Allbirds were the kind of uh, the trainer of choice if you're a Silicon Valley venture capitalist. It was it almost became a bit of a trope that <laughs> you'd have your Patagonia top and your Allbirds shoes and your Guinea latte or whatever it might be. A um, <laughs> lot of hype, 95% off since its IPO listing. The 95% loss of value. Doc Martens, again, a pretty enduring, again, German, had its moment in the sun. Every, you know, every teenager wanted to buy a pair of Doc Martens a few years ago, uh, down 67% from its IPO. So this is going to be super interesting. Is it, a, is it a hype cycle IPO, which is going to see us go down, 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 down? Or is it a, you know, a, a kind of enduring quasi luxury brand that's going to deal in its longevity and its exclusivity? Again, not here to give investment advice. I have no idea, but it'd be really fun to, 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 to watch the progress of Birkenstocks and I'm going to keep buying the shoes. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I know the, the common thread, like you touched on it earlier is about from which perspective are you looking at this? And if I was part of the, I guess if I had a, a, a company like Birkenstock or any clothing item, all birds, Doc Martens, they all fit in the same category of kind of these, these clothing items. Is it, if I was on the strategy team of that company, so from my perspective, I just want to cash out. I've been waiting for this. I'm part of this and I get an event and I get paid. So yeah, definitely taking these opportunities, as you said, these moments like Barbie or collaborations with Dior and 
uh, you know, give Kim Kardashian a free pair and she rocks it on Insta or whatever it is. But uh, yeah, being an investor and then having certain legal requirements, like I'm locked in, I kind of get out Mm. for a period. When it comes to fashion, fashion is so fickle and it's so fast. And it's almost like that fashion cycle. I mean, what was I watching? Uh, You'll laugh at this. I was (laughs) flicking through Sky last night and I landed on some of the music channels and it was the 90s. There's a 90s music channel, which is obviously for you and I, the bread and butter. And it was, uh, take that. I want you back for good. 1995, they're all there. And they look absolutely bang on trend. (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, yeah. For 2023 Absolutely. i was like my god they look like the current advert for like yeah for for a, for a fashion paris walk show or something but um the point being is i'm trying to make i guess here is that with the fashion names i just feel like yeah i'd definitely be in it from an internal person working at the company from a strategic perspective for an investment if i was a, 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 an investor I I think I'd steer clear of fashion. It's just too, Mm. too rapid in its, in its change, particularly it's been almost like revolutionized by technology where something goes on TikTok and all of a sudden, bang, there's a new thing. And then the old thing's gone and you just can't execute the IPO process quick enough. Which is why the LMVH uh, market capitalization is is so high because it is you know it it is the endure way well, is a combination of enduring uh, very exclusive fashion labels that seem to ride out uh, hype cycles and ride out market trends and things like that. But I just want to very quickly go back to to your point on kind of again we're always we're all talking about different perspectives and investors and things like that. And I think what's interesting about all of these examples is looking at the process of raising money and then exiting it's it feels a bit like a game of pass to parcel right can you you know if i'm a if i'm an early stage founder i want to get a good valuation that first investor wants to get a better second valuation that third investor wants to get a better third valuation and then at some point you know obviously the company's growing alongside at some point there may be a moment where someone's left with the parcel and we realized that the company's not really all, <laughs> all it's made up to be. So in the case of Instacart, that was the 2021 $39 billion valuation. I'm left with this valuation that I realize is probably a bit phony. And I'm left, you know, with the with the parcel in my hand. Often again, we, you know, in these IPOs, it gets left with the retail investor or, or, or the institutional investor. Mm. So just going back to the top of the show then, addressing that question, is the IPO market opening back up? So what are your thoughts on that? And and how does this kind of compare to where we were just during that COVID boom? Yeah, so, I mean, we're a long way away. Uh, so just looking at some stats, uh, there's been 113 IPOs this year. And bearing in mind, the IPO market was pretty much shut uh, in the first six months of the year. So it has ramped up. There's 180, 181 IPOs last year in the depths of IPO winter. And 1,035 IPOs in 2021. Oh wow! Increasingly, 2021 is looking like this kind of this this case study year. Um, and whenever we're you know walking through graphs of deal volume and value when, when we're teaching, we always spend a lot of time looking at 2021 because it is the biggest skyscraper in a bar chart. And what the heck are SPACs doing? And 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 all of this kind of stuff. So yes, this is looking modest from an IPO perspective and obviously the fact that we got three or four quite big ones coming in big uh, in quick succession and I think CVC uh, private equity firms planning on listing in November as well so you've got some you know you've got a decent pipeline and and the investment bankers are going to be happy about this but it's certainly you know 1035 in 2021 that was you know I'd say that that was just as degenerate a year in terms of trends, in terms of a normal functioning market as 2022, when there was only 181. So kind of somewhere in between feels about right. Um, so is the market, is the IPO market back open to an extent? And Clavio and Birkenstock will further cement that or, or, or otherwise. I was just thinking, actually, to add to your cautionary tales, I wonder what some of those EV US EV Lucid and and the like. I wonder how much they're down on the year. It's got to be in the 80s at least. 
Uh, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you another little challenge. Um, I was just looking back at 20 and, you know, a lot of people that listen to this podcast are new students and, and why should you know too much about 2021? (laughs) Um, You might probably still back at school. Um, So back in 2021, I mean, all of the companies we've spoken about today, all four of them are profitable, right? Mm. Big difference between now and 2021. Just looking at some of the unprofitable venture backed tech companies that went, that went public back in 2021. I'm going to give you a list of five companies. I want you to pick out the one company that you think the share price has actually gone up. Okay. Okay. Um, Squarespace, the website uh, maker, (laughs) the online website maker. Duolingo, the the language, uh, the app-based language app. Bumble, the dating website, uh, the dating app. Warby Parker, it's not really a tech company, but it sells uh, sells glasses. And Rivian, that... uh, that EV manufacturer, or at least uh, <laughs> wants to manufacture electric vehicles. So which one, four of those five went down, a bit have gone down since 2021. One of them's gone up, what do you reckon? Okay, so process of elimination. Yeah. Uh, I know it's not Rivian, so take that out, at least four. <laughs> Correct. So then it comes to Bumble, twofold. I remember us talking about it. So if we're talking about it, I'm assuming it's gone down. And secondary to that, I think Bumble probably had its day in COVID when everyone was stuck at home trying to flirt and date. So I'm going to strike Correct. Bumble out. Correct. That leaves three. Uh, Duolingo, I guess, is tied to travel and travel has opened up. But mm, I don't, I'm going to just, I'm just going to take another view on that. I'm going to scrub them out. Okay. That leaves me then with glasses or websites. <laughs> so glasses. I'm just going to go on the pure thinking of people are not at home so much during those COVID years. Mm. So they're out and about. They're not looking at phones and tablets and screens as much. So glasses demand has flattened. And therefore, I'm going to go Squarespace. You're wrong. um so uh rivian down 71 percent warby parker down 70 percent bumble down 65 percent squarespace down 41 percent duolingo up 59 percent wow okay now your, your logic was absolutely right but i didn't tell you any of the pricing right so so rivian it again we talk about price sales it had zero sales so you can't even do a price sales calculation when it when it ipo did a 66 billion dollar market cap warby parker priced at 10 times trailing 12 months revenue really really high for what is effectively a glasses company duolingo actually got it right and they priced at two times trailing 12 months revenue really modest actually Mm. and that is actually that's the reason why It's the only one that's been successful. Can I just ask a question on that point? Yeah. So when it's modest, who is leading that? The company or the advisor? Because there's conflict of interest there. So how how do you, or is it because the strategic idea is that they don't want an event to exit, the the founder and the owners, they just basically want an event to get liquidity to then grow. Is Is that the idea? And then yeah, you have so to like, would... tame the bankers when they're getting their paws on bigger fees. Yeah, I have absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know the Geolingo IPO very well, but I can imagine it could have been priced a lot more back, you know, a lot higher back in 2021. But uh, yeah, so this is probably, as you say, this is not a dash for the exit. This is not a kind of, you know, I'm so tired of running this company and the investors are bored of being in it. It's an opportunity like IPOs, you know, historically have been. It's an opportunity to raise some money at a relatively good valuation that's not going to anchor the company at a overvaluation and then have a bad news story for the next two or three years. So that was probably the conversations that were happening. And, you know, if I'm part of a company, let's say I got some stock options on the IPO as an employee, um, and we all got very excited when the bell was rung, and I see that, that my share price is up 59%, I'm going to be pretty happy. I'm going to be quite motivated. Whereas if I got some stock options in Bumble or Squarespace or Warby Barker, I'd be like, well, what kind of company am I working for? Market thinks we're 70% worse than when I got my options. So yeah, there's, there's a lot more to it than just, 
trying to get the maximum. Obviously, the bankers want the maximum valuation, but mm. cool. More, more, more quiz questions in future like that. And I'm sure the <laughs> listeners had a go, had a stab at that. So well done if you got it, if you got it right. But look, let's uh, let's aim to then uh, wrap up with this idea of a lot of people are in the application process applying to roles um, in banking or equity capital markets, maybe specifically, and they get asked this question about talk about a deal. But mm-hmm. rather than just talk about a deal, we've kind of covered that. Can they have a little extra special source to make them sound a little bit more well-informed and knowledgeable about actually the role that banks play and the breakup of the division of kind of influence and power that they have within the deal. And I, this comes from a place where I think I read on your post about Instacart that Goldman's and JP were leading it, but then mm-hmm. there was, I think it was Barclay, City and Bamel were also on the ticket. So yes. how do you break those roles up? Yeah, so the best way to think about it or the best way to understand where different banks sit in an IPO process is just to look at the second page of the prospectus. And it's a lovely it's a lovely uh, visual representation of where these people these banks sit. So the biggest font the biggest font at the top of the stack are the lead left or the lead book runners, right? So this is the most important banks in the process. They come up the top and they're the biggest fonts. And then underneath maybe you call them the co-managers or whatever it might be. There are different titles. You'd have the secondary tier of banks. And we'll talk about how important they are in a minute. And then below that, in an even smaller font, you have the kind of subscribing banks or or whatever it might be. Now, if you are applying for a rolling uh, equity capital markets team, you know, you want to be on as many lead left transactions as possible. Because if you are a leading bank in the deal, if you're the biggest font at the top of the page, you're not only providing your ability to underwrite a deal, i.e. to take a percentage of the deal and allocate it to your institutional investor base, but you are playing the role of advisor, confidant, roadshow manager, price setter, all of the fun stuff that comes with doing an IPO. If you're lower down on the ticket, Either you're just given a smaller allocation in order to get away to your institutional investor base, or maybe you're put on the ticket because you're providing some auxiliary services. Maybe you've lent them money or you've helped them issue a convertible bond or something like that. And they put you on the ticket because you want a cred. It's all about creds in the banking world. So you want to be getting on that top tier lead left position because then that's where you get to influence pricing. That's where you get to do all of the stuff that we do in our IPO simulations, the road shows, the pitch deck creation, the price setting, the modeling and, and, and all of that stuff. So that's where you want to be. Yeah. So if a student could describe like right there, it's like, uh, Stephen, why do you want to work in equity capital markets then? And then like yeah, that, the response you just gave them was so good. Cause it was sounded like, yeah, it's, it's super interesting, right? And there's lots of responsibility. There's lots of variation within it. And so, and understanding that hierarchy or that structure, I think, yeah, definitely I don't hear many people who are giving careers advice talk about it in that way. So that's great. Yeah. And the, the last thing I would say is, is in this whole area, the Deal Room podcast, we are advisors. Advisory is the word that we need to keep remembering. Um, and any position that you can get into in a in an in a investment banking team where you feel like you are a trusted advisor where a company relies upon you to provide high quality advice that's where you want to land because that's where it gets really interesting i was speaking to a, an old colleague yesterday who said you know 150 CEO, cfos have my phone number um and you know they can they can phone me up and have a, a bit of a moan or they can ask my advice or sound me out on something you know he's a managing director but that's where you want to be aiming for because it becomes a much more personable strategic role you know you're not going to get there straight away but that's the path that you want to be on oh sounds like your your friend has a lot of leverage for a pay rise right there but uh... <laughs> yeah yeah he bought the drinks <laughs> <laughs> all right cool well let, let's wrap it up Um, Thanks, everyone, for listening. If you have made it to the end of the show, thank you for sticking with us. And uh, of course, as ever, feel free to connect with both Stephen and I on our LinkedIn uh, on both 
um, the the bottom of the show notes. However, we forgot to mention Stephen M and A Finance Accelerator. Just to finish, tell us a little bit about this launch of this new product that you're releasing. Yeah, absolutely. So you'll see it coming out on LinkedIn and in the Market Maker, our newsletter as well. So uh, Amplify has historically done a, a sales and trading finance accelerator, which is open to all students. Uh, it's a kind of, and we go around the country and go around Europe and, and, and do these fantastic simulations. We are launching the M&A version of that finance accelerator. The first event, the first simulation, it's going to be on October the 5th. Um, we are going to post all about it over the next couple of weeks. It's a free sign up. It's a free event. It's an opportunity for you to learn a bit more about the industry, test your skills, test your Excel skills, test, test your financial modeling skills, uh, and maybe even put forward to, uh, to a place in our M&A Academy. Cool. Sounds great. Well, with that, we'll wrap it up. Thanks, everyone. And catch you next week. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you.